rainy, gloomy, winter Ohio morning, but you're here, and I'm glad for that. So if we could all stand, and we'll do our opening hymn, our opening call to worship. church. Hey, it's great to see you the Sabbath morning. We're so glad that you're here worshiping with us. Why don't you take a moment to greet somebody next to you, in front of you, behind you, and let them know that you're glad to see them here. You may be seated. So glad uh, that everybody is here this morning. Uh, we'd like to especially welcome our visitors, and to our visitors, you are welcome here. It's our prayer that you'll get a blessing from our service together and that you'll sense the presence of God working in our lives as we worship him together today. So as if you're visiting, there's a card in the back of the pew. If you take that card and fill it out and then you could put it in the offering plate later in the service, we'd appreciate that. And um, Otherwise, uh, we have a couple announcements to make, and uh, the first is tonight is a very special concert. Uh, all the churches in Firestone Park area are getting together at St. Paul's Church over on Brown Street to uh, have a Christmas celebration, and it is an enjoyable experience. It's a wonderful experience. And our own uh, Mayfair Christian School our children are gonna be doing a chimes uh, piece in there, and uh, so it'll be really nice to uh, see our kids perform in, in, with everyone. The choir will be there, uh, the orchestra, so many good things that will be going on this evening. And then afterwards, they have a little uh, time for refreshments following. So that's tonight at seven o'clock, and uh, so uh, plan on being there. Several other announcements in the bulletin to uh, keep in mind. Uh, thank you as we are nearing to the end of the year to help to work on our budget, to keep uh, uh, our budget in line as good as uh, well as possible. So thank you for that. Let's ask God's presence in our worship this morning. So Lord, we have come through another week. We thank you for that. Uh, we have had challenges this week. We've had good things happen, difficult times. And we, we ask now that you would be here in this service because we need to hear from heaven. We need your presence. We ask for your spirit to bless us, encourage us, guide us. So bless us now with your presence and thank you in the powerful, wonderful name of Jesus our Lord, amen. I love this time of year because this is when all the songs that we don't usually sing except for around Christmas time come out. And so um, this song, Angels from the Realm of Glory, is an old uh, Christmas song. 
and later on you will hear kind of a different version of this song so listen to how it's sung as a hymn and then just keep tuck that away and we'll hear that later on
and happy Sabbath. Um, over the course of the last month, well, in the month of November, we were discussing uh, Camp Mohaven quite a bit. Uh, we prayed for Camp Mohaven, um, thinking about if there was money we felt like we could pledge for this new building project. But today, and that is our offering emphasis today, is Camp Mohaven. But I wanted to share a bit about why Camp Mohaven is special to me. Um, but first, I'm going to say it's used for many different events, and I'm sure you're all aware of that. But we have things like church retreats, which I think we have a picture maybe of one of our church retreats up there. Um, looks like we're eating always a good time when we're eating, right? Um, men's and women's retreats happen there, leadership training, um, Pathfinder events, adventure events, uh, young adult retreats, and there actually are quite a few um, other organizations that rent the camp as well. Um, every year, some dating back to the 60s, they've been there for a very, very long time. Um, but one of the things that's special to me about Camo Haven is summer camp. Um, many of you know that over the past, for the past seven summers, I have worked there at summer camp. And um, it is just a very pow powerful um, program that we have there during the summer months. Um, and so it's special to me um, because lives are changed there. And one of the things I love about Camp Mohaven is the nature that is there. Now, when a lot of you come down there, you're maybe just coming down for a day or a weekend, and maybe you don't see much more than the lodge. Um, but if you take the time to go around the camp, and there, it's a really large camp there. There's over 700 acres. Um, it's beautiful. So last summer, every morning I would get up before our staff worship, which some weeks that was at seven in the morning, so I got up before that, and I would go for a walk. And these walks that I took were a very special time for me. I got to pray and talk with God and just enjoy the nature. And these are some pictures that I would take every morning. I would take several pictures and um, post them on my old people social media, also known as Facebook. Um, I know, yeah, the young, yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> We've talked about this. Um, and with the hope that others would be blessed um, by the nature that God has there for us. Um, another thing that's very special about summer camp, and, and, you know, that's just my experience because I've been there a lot for six weeks at a time, but lives are changed, as I mentioned, um, on... Friday nights at summer camp, we have an agape feast and we have the passion play. And these young people that come to camp every summer have the opportunity to make a decision to follow Christ for the rest of their lives. And that is just a very powerful evening. It's my favorite time of camp. And I think that um, some of you that are here that may have been at camp, either as a staff member or as a camper, maybe it's your favorite time too. Um, the last picture, I've, we have a few pictures up here, is, uh, was from I think two summers ago, and I did not ask permission, so I hope you're okay with this picture. <laughs> um, but this is Jaslyn, one of our own, who was baptized at camp. And that was just a very special moment. And there usually isn't a week that goes by that a few tears aren't shed for me because it's just such a special, a special moment. Um, so this morning, our offering um, focus is on Camp Mohaven, and it's, it's the camp as a whole, not just the summer camp ministry. But if you feel that God has placed upon your heart to give just a little bit more, I know it's a rough time of year. We have a lot of projects that we're giving to, and the holidays are coming up. Um, but if you do feel called to give to this special um, program within our conference, please make sure you mark that on your envelope um, for our offering today. I want to share a verse in 2 Corinthians 8, um, 7 to 9 that says, But just as you excel in everything, in faith, and speech, and knowledge, in complete earnestness and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. 
I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Will the deacons please stand? Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for everything that you've provided for us. Sometimes we feel like we want more and we get a little greedy. But Lord, we should just be thankful for what we do have. And if possible, help us to be able to give to others. Um, bless the offerings that are given today. Help them to go towards the camp or a church, whatever we feel called to give to. And be with us as we go throughout the rest of our Sabbath day. Thank you for all your blessings. Amen. Thank you. now the time for a children's story and Jean Ruff will be given the story this morning children and if you come forward and bring an offering for Mayfair Christian School the Worthy Student Fund we would appreciate that so much. Can you hear me? Happy Sabbath. Did you have a good week? You did? I did too. We praise the Lord. Today I have some questions for you. 
first question is, is it okay to take something that is not mine? Can I take something and keep it if it's not mine? I see heads nodding. Is it okay for you to take something that's not yours? Is it okay to borrow something from someone and not return it? I see. Overwhelmingly, no. Okay. Taking something that's not yours, you or me, or borrowing something and not return, looking for. What is it called if you take something that's not yours? Or if you borrow something and you don't return it, is there a certain word for that? Starts with S. Stealing. stealing. That's right. So is it okay to steal? No. Why? Can you tell me. Because that's bad. <laughs> it is bad. But what else? Jesus doesn't want us to steal. He said in his Ten Commandments, Thou shalt not steal. So stealing is not good. Had you ever heard someone use the expression, finders, keepers? You have? What do you think that means? Finders, keepers. Uh, the thing you find, you're going to keep it. Okay, that suggests that if I find something, it automatically belongs to me. Is that right? So, let me use an illustration. If sometime today I go into the ladies' room, and I'm the only one there, and I find an envelope on the floor, and in it, it contains five $20 bills. Is that mine? No, it's not. So, let's suppose, where is Pastor Bill? He was going to be here. He reneged on me. Okay, um, let's suppose I find this envelope and it contains five $20 bills and I'm thinking, that's not mine. I'm going to pretend you're Pastor Bill. I'm going to give it to Kara here and... Um, or if I find an elder or someone. But before I do that, there are 20, five $20 bills. How about if I just take one, put it in my purse, and then I go to pretend Pastor Bill. I said, Pastor, I just found this in the bathroom, and I don't know whose it is. And I leave it up to him to deal with it. Was that stealing? Was that the right thing to do? Was it? Did you see what I just did? What did I do? Did you see me take a $20 bill out and kept it? Was that right? Was I being honest? No. But no one saw me. But guess what? Who said thou shalt not steal? Go ahead. God. God saw me. That's right. So, even though I pretended to give all the money back, I kept some for myself. And that was not right, because God was not happy about it. So, is it okay to steal? Okay. Here's the rest of your story. Oh. Well, something. Sorry. Um, what are you guys talking about? Stealing. Okay, well then maybe you can help me out. I need some advice, okay? I went grocery shopping this week, and I bought all my groceries, and when I got home, there was a bag of 7-Up in my groceries, and I love 7-Up. But guess what? I actually didn't buy the 7-Up. I think they might have mistakenly given me somebody else's 7-Up, but the store hasn't called me, and nobody's come looking for their 7-Up, and Christmas is coming up, and we're making punch, what do you think I should do with my 7-Up? Sounds like you guys were just talking about this. Should I keep it and use it in the Christmas punch? Oh, no, okay. What should I do? Go back to the store and give it back? Are you sure? I am a very busy person. <laughs> she doesn't believe me. <laughs> 
You all think I should go to the store and give it back? Show of hands, who thinks I should take it back to the store on Monday? Oh, I think that's a majority. I think you all are right, because here's the thing, that even when nobody sees what we're doing, God sees what we're doing. Well, I'm glad I interrupted, and I'm glad that you all gave me good advice. Who would like to pray for me? May I ask you? Okay, I'll go ahead and pray, that's okay. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, so much for, again, the wonderful children that are represented here and what they learn about you every time they come to church. Bless their families, Lord, as they continue to raise them in the fear of you. And may we, Lord, remember that through the help of your spirit, we can always be who you need us to be, even when no one is watching. Thank you. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. At this time, we have the honor and the privilege to, to come before God and to bring our requests and our praises to him. And so we just want to bring a few um, prayer requests uh, to the church's attention. Many of these you've known about for a long time. Some are new. Uh, we want to keep Lucky Minister in prayer. We've been praying for him for a while, but um, he's just given us an update that he may possibly have COVID now as well. So we want to make sure that we continue to pray for him. Uh, we want to keep our principal, Kim Purvis, in mind. She had a fall this week and has um, had some injuries, not feeling well. We have many people on the list who need healing, many people on the list who are, are struggling with cancer and need God's healing and protection. Several of our church members or family members are, are dealing with grief and loss as uh, friends and family members have passed away. And so we have two people as well who are waiting on transplants. We have Pierre May who is waiting for a heart transplant and Don Drury waiting for a liver transplant. Many concerns um, physically as well as spiritually and emotionally in our, in our church family. So I encourage you to, um, to join me in prayer today but also to take this list home and to think of these um, individuals and remember them in your personal prayers at, at home as well. Also, if you would like to um, pray with somebody, there will be people up here standing um, up here after the service and they will pray with you um, for whatever needs uh, you may have or things that you want to bring before God. So if you're able, uh, please kneel with me at this time as we bring our, our praise and our requests before God. Dear God, we thank you just for who you are and all that you've done for us. We thank you that we have come through another week and that we are here um, in your presence and, and worshiping you, the almighty God. We thank you for, for your character, one of love, one of mercy, and of grace. The salvation and the forgiveness that you provide each and every one of us every moment of every single day. And because of that, Father, we can live in the joy of our salvation and in the hope of Lord, we, we thank you for the gifts that you have given us, for your protection, the way that you've provided for all of our needs. We have had food, we've had clothing, shelter, we've been warm for another week, for another month, for another year. And it is all because you have taken care of us, because you have provided for us. And every struggle and every heartache and everything that um, each one of us have gone through we're still here, and it's because of your love and your protection. Lord, we ask that you would be with each of our prayer requests. Some of them are new, some we've been praying for for a long time. And you know each one of their needs. You know the heart of each person. You know their physical needs, emotional, spiritual, and you know how to heal. You are the great physician, the one who can heal physically and emotionally but Father, you are the one who heals spiritually. And we would ask that you would put your hand and your power on everybody's heart and life. We ask that you would give each one of us hearts and minds that would submit to you and to your will, and that we would live in a way that is, is honorable and, and holy for you. Lord, we also ask that you would send your spirit 
in a special way upon this time and this church, and this service, particularly on the pastor as, as your word is brought, that you would speak through him and that our hearts would be open and ready to receive it. Lord, again, we thank you for your love, for all the things that you have done for us. And we just praise you and worship you. Amen. I like to think of um, the angels when Jesus was born. There was such excitement in heaven. They couldn't contain it. They couldn't contain their excitement, and they burst out into song. And, and I love to imagine what that must have looked like and what it must have sounded like. And sometimes when we can get into an attitude of praise and worship, the song just comes and bursts from us as well. So um, they had good reason to, to rejoice because an infant was born in the world who was the incarnate God. It, it, it's a mystery. We don't understand it, but we can rejoice in it. Son 
Thank you. That was very worshipful. And it fits right in with the message today, which you won't be uh, evident at the very beginning, but it will, you'll see where it goes. In October 1871, the great Chicago fire destroyed much of this bustling city of Chicago. But surprisingly, the flames actually started on the other side of the Chicago River. So how did the fire cross over the river, because it's pretty wide at that point, and reach the buildings of Chicago? The river jumping fire is partially explained not only by the high winds that spread the fire, but the wooden ships that were in the harbor back at that time, they were moored on the river. There was, however, another more important factor that caused the fire to spread. In those days, the Chicago River was a shallow, sluggish sewer for the entire city. And it was absolutely filthy. The Union stockyards in Chicago dumped all of their animal waste into the river. People called it the Stinky River, rightly so. And it was so bad that the waste was actually combustible. Now, have you ever heard that closer to home here? Uh, Cuyahoga Falls River, I believe, uh, has had that problem in the past. And so, of course, when the fire broke out, the actual river caught on fire, which in turn caught buildings on the other side on fire. And after this devastating event, finally everything settled down. People became much more aware of all the raw sewage and putrefaction flowing from the Chicago River right out into Lake Michigan, just as it had been going on for years before that. But the interesting thing is of this story, and the really disgusting thing, was that not too far from where the river waters flowed out into Lake Michigan, there were the drinking water intake pipes for the city. That's a recipe for disaster, right? Put two and two together, and as they saw more and more people getting waterborne diseases, every year through the 1880s and 1890s, at least 10,000 people died from cholera and typhoid fever. In 1885, 14 years after the Great Chicago Fire, nearly 100,000 people had now died from the illness carried by the river's terrible waters. Finally, the city engineers took action. First, they started digging 28 miles of canal. They moved earth and rocks more of that than was taken to open up the Panama Canal. So it's a huge event. They strategically set in the locks and the gates along the river, and so finally on Friday, January 2nd, 1900, a worker opened the first sluice gate at Lake Michigan, and the gate of metal slid up and down in the grooves and it controlled the water levels and the water flow of the rivers and the canals. The gates of the Chicago River allowed the waters of Lake Michigan now to flow into the Chicago River, pushing everything in the opposite direction than what it had flowed before. So the flow of the river had actually been reversed, and when it was reversed, it now flowed into the canal into the Des Plaines River, into the Illinois River, and eventually into the Mississippi River. We're not told about what happened to those communities along the way when it reversed, but it did wonders for Chicago. In fact, many people say that if it wasn't for this great engineering feat and reversing the river, Chicago might not have ever come about to be the city that it has become today. <clears throat> this river now brought the city life. 
The American Society of Civil Engineers named it one of the great engineering projects of the millennium. And there's a similar principle at work when we think about our walk with Jesus. Because in our lives, we have our lives filled with so many things that are wrong, so many things that are upside down, so many things that are not good for us. And so what Jesus does in our lives is more astonishing than what the engineers did for the Chicago River. Christ reverses the flow of the human soul. He reverses the flow when he comes into our life. Instead of a shallow, sluggish, diseased waters of human sinfulness, Jesus has now opened the sluice gates of new and living water in our lives. And what good news that is. What amazing news that is. So when a person puts their faith in Christ, Christ restores that life that has been broken and polluted by sin, and he restores their relationship with God by his atonement for sin and gives us victory over sin in our lives. Now when we look at our chapter today, Isaiah chapter 60, as we get a glimpse of God's restorative work, we realize the impact, somewhat of the impact of what it would have, what it would do. He lays out his plans for Israel, which reach all the way down into our day. And these plans are available to everyone who loves him, and because of his grace and the gift of salvation, he gives a sneak preview of what is to come. So as we read these verses, it will be important to imagine how the people of Isaiah's day heard these words. And so a little background to this will help. The people of Israel were a war-torn people who were not doing very good at all in their relationship with God. And I would have to say probably the same is very true today. In fact, as you recall, all throughout the book of Isaiah, God was working hard to get their attention and guide in their way of life. But the Israelites wouldn't listen and insisted on following their own way and doing their own things. This eventually led them to wars with their surrounding nations. And the further they wandered away from God, the deeper they dug themselves into the hole that they weren't able to climb out of. When they read this passage from Isaiah, though, Isaiah, uh, Israel had just come out of captivity from Babylon, and on their return, they found Jerusalem in shambles from all the wars, from all the pillaging, from all the things the imposing nations had put on them, and all hope in their eyes was lost. And in their future, there was no promise, there was no city, no economic structure, and there seemingly were insurmountable hardships that they were going to have to face. And so in the midst of all this, to hear the words of Isaiah sharing something so amazing and so unbelievably good, they are stunned, they are just taken back. Can they believe this prophecy? That's the question. And so they have to let the implications set in to see if these things could really be true. What they also had to realize is that these things, for these things to take place, they need to trust God. There's something on their end that they need to do, something that we need to do on our end too, is to put our trust in God. So Isaiah 60 opens for us a view of how things will turn out for those of us who boldly follow Christ as our Savior. And it reveals the true, final, ultimate restoration of God's plan for Israel of old and his people of today. Are you interested in what Isaiah 60 has to say? Because there's a lot of amazing things in there. Isaiah 60, verse 1, and reading through. 
Arise, shine, for your light has come. Your light was God, your light is Jesus. Arise and shine, put off the dreary, put off the uh, disappointment, put off those things that are challenges looming before you. Arise and shine, for your light has come, for the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. And when we see the glory of the Lord, as Jan was talking about in the song, how beautiful it is to see the Christ child, as we realize who this Christ child is to us, as we see the greatness of God and his majesty, arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. We are in the midst of verse 2. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness on the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. Isn't that something that is exciting to think about? That God's glory will be seen upon us, and it's not so much us, but they're seeing God in us. That's an amazing thing to think about. And all nations will, will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising because something is happening, something is taking place, something is working in the lives that people aren't accustomed to. And you know, with all the different things going on in churches everywhere, there should be more evidences of God's spirit. And this is a call to seek God's spirit and allow God's spirit to work in us and through us to make a difference in our lives. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They ga all gather together, they come to you. Your sons come from afar and your daughters shall be carried on the hip. Then, then you shall see and be radiant. Then you shall see and be radiant. I can think of many times when I have performed weddings and we say of the bride that she is radiant. She's beaming with joy, with happiness. And God wants that to be a part of our lives, that our lives are radiant, filled with God's spirit, filled with his glory and shining his glory to others. Your heart shall thrill and exult because of the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of nations shall come to you. Now, as you're thinking about this, this has uh, allusions to the story in the book of Luke to the wise men who came from the east. And think about some of these things that are saying in Isaiah 60 and compare them to Luke where the wise men came. And a multitudes of camel shall cover you, and young camels of Midian and Ephath, and those of Sheba shall come, so from all over. Now camels, we think of camels and we think, ah, they're dirty animals. But camels to them, they were the Lamborghini of the day. They were the powerful car of the day. And so when camels come in groups to you, you're a very wealthy person. And so this was exciting. They shall bring gold and what? Frankincense. And shall bring good news, the praises of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar and, uh, will be gathered to you and the rams of Naboth shall minister to you and they shall come up with acceptance on my altar and I will beautify my house. God's house will be a beautiful place with his radiant people inside, with his people shining because of God's glory in them, on them, through them. Who are these that fly like a cloud and like doves to their windows? For the coastlands shall hope for me and the ships of Tarshish first to bring your children from afar and silver and gold with them. For the name of the Lord your God and for the Holy One of Israel, because he has made you 
beautiful. He has made you beautiful. Isn't that nice to hear? God has made you beautiful. That's God's design for us. Foreigners shall build up your walls and the king shall minister to you for my wrath, uh, in my wrath I struck you, but in my favor I've also had mercy on you. Your gates shall be open continually, day and night, and they shall not be shut. Uh, the people may bring to you uh, that they may bring to you the wealth of the nations where their kings lead in procession. Now we're transferring over more in view of Revelation chapter 21. We're seeing some things that are very dramatic taking place. For the nation and kingdom that uh, will not serve you shall perish, and those nations shall be utterly laid waste. And the glory of Lebanon shall come to you, and the cypress, the plain, the pine, to beautify the place of my sanctuary, and I will make the place of my feet glorious. What does it say down when he comes? The final time at the end of the millennium that he'll put his feet down on the Mount of Olives and the earth will spread out before him to make way for the new Jerusalem. The sons of those who you afflicted shall come bending low to you and all who despise you shall bow down at your feet and they shall call you the city of the Lord the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Whereas you have been forsaken and hated with no one passing through, I will make you majestic forever, a joy from age to age. Now this is the Israel of God in prophecy. That means it's that people that believe in Jesus, that have come to understand who the Messiah is and how the Messiah reigns and how he wants to reign in our lives. And his reign is not an oppressive reign, that we are to oppress others, but our job is to reach out to others and bless them and encourage them and help them in life's way. You shall suck the milk of nations. You shall nurse at the breast of kings. You shall know that I, the Lord, am your savior and your redeemer, the mighty one of Jacob. Instead of bronze, I will give you gold. Instead of iron, I'll bring silver. Instead of wood, bronze. Instead of stone, iron. I will make you overseers peace and your taskmasters righteousness. Violence shall no more be heard in your land. Devastation and destruction within your borders you shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise. The sun shall no more be your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give you light, but the Lord will be your everlasting light. The sun goes down and it brings darkness. And the moon at best reflects the light of the sun. But we will have a constant brightness of the glory of God in the very midst of us. Your God will be your glory. Your sun shall go down no more, nor your moon withdraw itself, for the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of mourning shall be ended. Your people shall be all be righteous. They shall possess the land forever. Forever is a long time. The branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I might be glorified. God finds great joy when we have joy in our hearts. When we have Jesus in our hearts. When we have his love in our hearts. The least one shall become a clan and the smallest one a mighty nation. I am the Lord. And in its time, I will hasten it. This is his promise to us. It's a promise of rejoicing. It's a promise of, of finding renewal in God and moving our attention and our heart from the things that weigh us down in this world 
to turning to God and finding in him his glory, his brightness, his brilliance. The amazing work of his hands is for you and me. What reality are you living in? Are you in, living in the reality of this world? With all its entrapments, with all its facades, with all the things that it promises you that breaks constantly? Are you living in the reality of God, where the fullness of God grows stronger and stronger, and the scene of the brightness of God and the glory of God gets greater and greater until that day. We know that terrible things happen on this earth and will continue to happen until he comes again. But we also know that Jesus has obtained the victory. The devil is already defeated. The battles go on, but we knew who the victor is. And as long as we keep our eyes fixed on him, we will be with him. So in this chapter, Isaiah 60, he communicates this dazzling brightness of God's glory that will shine on his kingdom. And here he asks for the imagination of his hearers to stretch their thinking to the limits. And he shares with them words that bring a hope beyond belief. The coming of the Redeemer to Israel will be like a stunning dawn. Back in verse 1, it said, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. With a double imperative, arise, shine, the prophet invokes the power of God to bring the redeemed people from the dust of sin to the dignity and standing with the esteemed of the redeemed. We are a redeemed people. The price has been paid. Our penalty has been released because of Jesus and what he has done. And so our hope is built in Jesus, in Christ. And by the same redemptive power, they will personally glow with the Shekinah glory of his presence as a reflection of their righteousness. Our righteousness is not about ourselves. Our righteousness is Jesus. And in Jesus, we have life and light and glory. So, that first verse says, and the glory of the Lord shall be risen upon you. And in the second verse, it says, the Lord will rise upon you. And so what this is saying is that Sin's sleep or deep darkness is instantly turned into the radiance of redemption. What reality are you living in? Are you living in the radiance of redemption? Are you living in the depression of this world? We have that choice to make every day. According to Isaiah, Gentiles and kings will be drawn to the light of the glory of God that will shine in the new Jerusalem and all people will come to the light that has freed them from sin and leaders will come with the recognition that the self-glory fades against the brightness of his shining. Shine, Jesus, shine. We love to sing that, don't we? When the time comes with the rising of light of God's glory upon the city of God, the sons of daughters of Israel will come home and the city will be the greatest center of intersection for peace, prosperity, abundance, and beauty that has ever been known. We, his subjects, will be honored in that city because we have gone through something that no one ever else has gone through before or ever will go through. Because we have been, re been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. By the drawing power of his light, God himself says, and I will glorify the house of my glory. And then throughout Isaiah's prophecies, he has spoken of the twin virtues of personal righteousness righteousness and social justice as the qualities of life that reflect the presence of God. 
personal righteousness. Jesus is my personal savior and he is my righteousness. And social justice, I live and treat others how I want people to treat me. I live with a heart for care for those that are hurting, those that are downcast, those who are struggling in life. In the New Jerusalem, the peace and righteousness of rulers and elders will set the tone for the city so that violence, waste, and destruction will never be known in its borders. That will all be behind us. That will be gone. I found six promises uh, from these texts that usher in the grand city of God. Six promises. First, found in verse 19, the people of Zion are promised that the Lord will be their everlasting light. The Lord will be our everlasting light. Light from the sun, our reflected light from the moon, both of which rise and wane, will no longer be necessary because the Lord will be our consistent light. Secondly, with the rising of the everlasting light, the days of mourning shall be ended. And Revelation 21 verse 4 echoes this promise, the comforting words. And God will do what? He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, and nor sorrow, nor crying. And there shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Third, righteousness will reign in the hearts of people. Jesus will reign in our hearts. I want Jesus to reign in my heart, but I'm like Paul struggling in Romans 7. I want to do the things that I agree that the law is good, but I find I'm struggling with that because of my human sinfulness. That sinfulness will be gone. Spirituality will be a matter of being created by the divine redemptive act and human faith combined and Isaiah's preaching of truth will no longer seem futile, his prophecy will be vindicated. Fourth, as a direct result of their faith in God, the people of the New Jerusalem will claim their rightful inheritance to the land promised them. Now you know that my mother recently passed away and um, she left a small inheritance and that inheritance is legally uh, belong, divided up in our family to legally belongs, my part belongs to me. And the inheritance of God's kingdom legally belongs to each one of us just as much as we have an inheritance from a family member. And even more so, it's more sure because the God has made it that way. Because of sin, the children of Israel had forfeited their birthright, but with faith as a qualifier the, and righteousness as the quality for the relationship, in the new Jerusalem, the birthright is restored and the land is given as proof of their inheritance. And the last time I looked in the Bible, it said that we have a place, a home in the city of the New Jerusalem with God. But then he also says that we have a home that we build in the country to our own design, our own desire. And nothing would limit what that home could be like. It would be more amazing the more we think about it, that we are God's people and we were with him safe in his kingdom now and evermore. How beautiful that is. Fifth point, closely related to the inheritance of the land is the restoration of the branch or the vine of God's own planted. God is no longer disappointed with the vineyard that he had planted and nurtured um, as he's spoken of not only in Isaiah but as in the Gospels. Righteousness replaces rebellion and God will be glorified through the life and activities of his people. 
Again, God is happy when we're happy. God is thrilled when we're thrilled. God wants us to be in that joyful place. And his plan is, when we claim our inheritance, it will be ours forever. Not to sit by idly. We'll have some amazing work to do that God has for us. Finally, six, no longer will God's people be forsaken, hated, despised, but will be attractive, loved, and honored because his people reflect the glory of God and the character and the glories of God will be abundant in our life. No more sin to hold us back. Our light has come in Jesus Christ and the glory of our Lord has risen on us. Once upon a time, the earth was made whole and beautiful, shimmering like an emerald, filled with glory, bursting with anticipation. Such wonders waiting to be unveiled, such adventures waiting to be ours. Creation was a fairy tale, a great legend, but in reality, this is a true story of the past, the story of our beginnings. Once upon a time, we were made to be whole and beautiful and glorious, striding through the garden, the sons and daughters of God. We were to be holy and powerful. We are to rule the earth and the animal kingdom with loving kindness. But as you know, Eden was vulnerable. Something dark slithered in the shadows, something most foul and sinister in the air. Banished from heaven, Satan and his fallen warriors came seeking revenge. And for the last 6,000 years, he has unleashed his sinister havoc on the people of this planet who were created in the image of God. But at last, the time of reckoning is near. If the coming restoration is to be fulfilled on earth and in our lives, Satan and his armies must be destroyed, never again to arise. And do you know that is the promise that God has given us? Never again to arise. Evil will not arise a second time. Can this promise be true? Evil is to be judged and utterly destroyed forever and ever. Gone. No more a hindrance to us, no more a drawback to us, no more sidetracking on the main issue. We will be spot on with the right focus. And it will be our joy to be filled with the glories of God. God announces this will be our reality, our true reality. Satan, his armies, and every form of evil will be destroyed with an eternal punishment. Just think, and some of you have lived in, in some pretty bad places. I know I have been in bad places uh, growing up years in different times and places I've lived in. What will it be like no longer having to ever worried about being assaulted? What will it be like to be utterly free from accusations? What will it be like to look in the mirror and hear no accusing thoughts or voices coming from our minds? You know, Satan wreaks havoc on our own minds and uh, just loves to tell how disappointing we are. And we hear that enough and we start repeating that. No more. It's not going to be because we are so successfully resisting sin in a moment of great resolve, but rather it's because sin is no longer in existence. It's gone. It's taken away. It's out of the picture. What will it be like to have the dark clouds lifted between us and our beloved Jesus? That veil that so often clouds our relationship with him now. 
Imagine when all the physical affliction and emotional torment, the abuse and all the evil in this world has vanished, it's gone, it's clean. What is that gonna be like? We'll be whole and wholesome and well and content and filled with joy and happiness. There is real hope that begins to rise at the thought of the world where the enemy no longer exists. To see our loved ones released from their lifelong battles, to be released from our own personal uh, struggles, knowing that we, with utter surety, that the kingdom of death and darkness has been destroyed. What is the redemption that our heart aches for on a personal level? on the level of our family and our friends? What cries fill your prayers at night? For some know the addiction of alcohol and the terrible scourge it does, or drugs. Abuse will no longer tear a family apart, nor poverty, nor shame, nor mental illness. Imagine a world without evil people where everyone loves God and overflows with his unspeakable love. And it will come naturally and beautifully and just flow out of us. You look to the right and you look to the left and you only see people you can trust confidently, truly. Holiness will permeate all things. Joy is the constant mood of the kingdom, not to mention the massive relief and vindication for our now chained souls. I am not all that I have been meant to be, but I will be unbridled, unplugged, completely free to be all that God created me to be and how glorious that will be. So my dear friends, these longings were given to you by God who loves you dearly and these longings will be fulfilled. Keep on keeping on, keep your eye on the mark. Don't give up, don't let go, stay with him and he'll take you to that place. Precious Lord, thank you so much for your kindness, your mercy. Thank you for the help that you give us today. But even more so, we think about the promise that is coming to us. Some days are difficult, some days are really hard, some days we are tempted, and some days we succumb. Lord, but always let us remember to keep our eyes on you. Give us a heart to understand how much you long for us, how much you miss us for being with you, that you understand the trials that we go through in this earth, the difficulties that we face. You understand and you long for the day that we could walk side by side, face to face, and we will be whole because of Jesus. Because it is in the mighty, wonderful, amazing name of our Savior. We say thank you, Jesus. And everybody says, amen. Let's all stand and sing our last song.
Lord, as we enter into this season of joy for what you have done, for the life that you have given to each one of us, for the hope that we have in heaven, we pray that our hearts would rise to the spirit of your leading, of your purpose, of your presence, and that our holiday season will be joy, joyful, so joyful that we won't want it to end. And they will love to be with you always from now on. So bless us, watch over us, keep us. And I pray that you would uh, just give us encouragement all this week until we come back next week and worship together again. In Jesus' name, amen. Before you leave, just a couple things. Uh, there will be people up front if you would like to have prayer. That We'll be glad to do that. Secondly, don't forget about our program tonight at St. Paul's Church on Brown Road at 7 o'clock. It will be an enjoyable experience. God bless you. 